So recently I was uh, talking to a colleague um, and I asked him, when was the last time did you feel like you could shut off your cell phone and pager and you felt completely relaxed? And he said, that was like five years ago. <laughs> so I asked him, what were you doing at that time? And he said, you know, I was under sedation getting my <laughs> colonoscopy. <laughs> And the sad thing is he was not, not kidding. So I realized that we have to find better ways of managing our brain. So, uh, so, so you know, about 80% of the patients get back pain at some point in life. So back pain is not an individual issue. It's a human problem. Similarly, 80% of people have excessive stress. So it's a human problem. So let's do a little thought experiment. Let's say you're watching a lion chasing a gazelle in a forest, and the gazelle escapes. What will she be doing two minutes later? She'll probably be nibbling on grass, sipping some water. Now a human being is being chased by a lion. The human being escapes. What is he doing two minutes later? Email. Checking emails. <laughs> that's, a, that's a difference, yes? He's probably posting it on in Instagram. Uh, <laughs> He's hyperventilating, he's going to need therapy very soon. <laughs> Never go back to forest again. Two species, same experience, very different outcome. And that is because of the way human brain is designed. So I would love to take you on a little backstage tour of the brain so that our brain can little, become a little bit more heartful. So when you woke up this morning today, did anyone wake up thinking, what a tough day, I'm going to be really appreciated too much today. Anyone here struggles with being appreciated too much? <laughs> Probably not. You, you woke up thinking about a number of open files in your head. An average person has 150 undone tasks. So my colleagues in neurosciences at Mayo Clinic, they wanted to see how the brain looks when we are resting not when we are working. They thought the entire brain will shut down. But this is the resting scan of the brain. This is an average of 300 brains. Each small square here is changed in blood flow that are organizing in blobs of blue and red forming and dissolving, which are networks in the brain. So our brain is a giant network of 86 billion neurons that collaborate to create two modes of the brain. The first one is the focused mode. Focus mode is immersive. So if, uh, if the organizers had baby giraffe walking in the aisle here, your brain will be in the focus mode. Best example of focus mode is when my younger daughter, then eight-year-old, would, would do what I like to call pee-pee dance. Pee-pee dance is when she drank a lot of fruit juice at a birthday party, and her legs are like this, and I'm like, honey, I think you've got to go. And she's like, no, daddy, I don't have to go, but she actually has to go. So anyone here who is working in a studying engagement metrics, uh, do a visual analog scale of your colleagues. Uh, in a typical week, how often do you do pee pee dance on your work desk? <laughs> Once a week, multiple times during the day, very good engagement metrics. So that is the first mode of the brain, the focus mode. Our brain loves to be in the focus mode. But there is a second mode called the default mode. Default mode is sometimes you're driving, you reach home, you have no recollection of anything you saw on the road. Or you're telling three things to your partner and they look totally blank. You are aware of this. This is mind wandering. So our brain toggles between these two modes all day long. But if we spend too much time in default, it becomes the dominant state of the brain. It is an actual structure in the brain, by the way. Its job is mind wandering and it is overactive. The more active it is, higher our risk of anxiety, depression, attention deficit, and, and even dementia. So we've, we've done a great job of developing the art of distraction. This predisposes to the second challenge of the brain, uh, which, uh, which you perhaps all are struggling at this moment, and that is brain fatigue. How long do you think it takes for the brain to get tired when you're doing something that is sort of borderline boring? Very quickly, right? So it's about 60 to 90 minutes when you're doing some cognitively engaging task. And you're not aware of this fatigue because brain has no pain receptors for itself. See, there are two kinds of organs in the body. Kidneys, for example. Has anyone said, I'm going to take, uh, you know, uh, put my kidneys to rest from like 2 to 5 p.m. in the afternoon? <laughs> Probably not. Brain gets tired in about 60 to 90 minutes, and we have to rest the brain, but we don't intentionally do that. 
So what that leads to is uh, fatigue and, and, and uh, lower engagement and lower mistakes and so on. So the question is, what is our brain hungry for? Our brain is hungry for rest. Rest is when you can let go of planning and problem solving. But what else is our brain hungry for? So I was seeing a patient at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and I'm really tired. At that time, my then 5-year-old is struggling with constipation for like five days in a row. Imagine a kid constipated at home. So my wife sent me a text. It said she did it with poop emoji. And so I wanted to get up and do high five with my patient. What did I, I have no fatigue the entire evening. What, that, what did I experience? Uplifting emotions. So our brain is hungry for uplifting emotions every 60 to 90 minutes. That's right. The third brain hunger is motivation. Why am I doing what I am doing? So those are the three brain hungers, other than oxygen, glucose, and micronutrients. Rest, uplifting emotions, motivation. Intrinsic or extrinsic, ideally both. The acronym is RUM. <laughs> so our brain is hungry for RUM every 60 to 90 minutes. But please don't come to work drunk and blame me. <laughs> this is the metaphoric RUM, by the way. So this is my life when I became aware of this science. So this is 2012. This is me. My energy level starts fairly well, and then it's just going down. Uh, but now what I do is strategic intake of rum every <laughs> 60 to 90 minutes. This is the core basis of the resilience approach that I have taken, which we have tested in over three dozen clinical trials and reached you know, several million people. So the question then is, what does that rum look like? So I'll give you a little flavor of that today. So one rum practice, and we call it morning gratitude. Morning gratitude is uh, a practice of waking up before leaving the bed, instead of letting those open files crowd our mind, thinking about the good people in our life and sending them our silent gratitude. So we'll practice it together, if that's OK with you. It's about two and a half minutes. Uh, so I invite you to close your eyes, and I'll take you through this very small micro practice. Imagine you are waking up in the morning. Try to recall the color of the floor where you woke up today. Now think about the first person in your life who matters a lot to you. Recall that person's smiling face. And then send that person your silent gratitude for being in your life. second person, and let this be someone who is in this theater with us today, in this auditorium with us today, someone you know or just came to know. Try to recall their hairstyle. And then send them your silent gratitude. third person, and let this be a child in your life. Your child, your sibling's child, your nephew, niece, friend's child. Look into the eyes of this child and notice the color of the eyes. And then send them your silent gratitude. fourth person, and for this person, think of someone mildly annoying. Just mildly annoying, not terribly annoying. Think about something nice related to this person.
and focusing on that nice aspect of them, send them your silent gratitude. Finally, think about someone who has passed away who you loved. Give that person a virtual hug and hold that hug for five seconds. When you are ready, you can open your eyes. So this is how I invite you to wake up in the morning and let the good people in your life know. I like to wake up thinking about my wife as the first person. We've been married, just celebrated 31 years of our marriage together. And by the way, it was my birthday yesterday, so thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, and of Sarah. Uh, so, uh, you know, our, our connection from being transactional has become much more affiliative because of us focusing on being grateful to each other first thing in the morning. So I invited you to think about the second person who is in with us today to be grateful to them. So over the next 30 seconds, I would love for you to get up and tell the person who you thought about that you were grateful for them and try to tell them the reason for that. You've got 30 seconds to wish the person you know, by your side. Okay, let's come back. Now that's the tough part. Let's come back. Let's come back. Security. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's okay. It's okay. Thank you. So that is, uh, um, uh, it's a beautiful feeling. Uh, multiple studies show that receiving gratitude is uplifting and giving gratitude some, to somebody is equally uplifting. Uh, the, the next idea I have is, so we practice this, uh, you, you, you thought about uh, a child in your life, and I want to leave you with a small practice. I am a proud dad of two princesses, um, and 19 and 13 year old. Uh, so there is a little practice I have done uh, over the last maybe about six, eight years where I have asked each one of them every three to six months, I ask them to give my 360 feedback. How am I performing as a dad? So what I would love for you to do is take out your phone and go to your photo stream and pull out the picture of the child who you're going to see this week and zoom in into their eyes and look at the color of their eyes. And I would love for you to do that when you come back home. This is the first thing I like to do is to look at my kids' eyes. There's something special about eyes. When we look at each other's eyes, we get uplifted. That's what puppies do to us. That's how we have a rise in oxytocin level. Multiple studies have shown that. Puppies show a significant rise in oxytocin when they see us. So that is the next idea I want you to leave, to, leave, to leave with you. Finally, this is my dishwasher when my wife loads it. And this is the dishwasher when I load it. 
you, you probably have someone in your life who doesn't load dishwasher exactly as you like. How many of you have a person like that in your life? Almost everybody. So the idea is please commit to accepting one minor imperfection of someone close to you for the next one week. I leave one more thought there. Do not let someone who shouldn't be in the story of your life write the title of your story. Because that's very important. So what I, I would love for you to do is think about some imperfection and make sure you commit, commit to accepting that. So this is your plan. Your plan is I commit to either waking up with gratitude, welcoming acute 360 feedback, or accepting one annoyance. So pick one idea. How many of you are willing to commit to one idea for the next one week? And I'm going to take a picture here. I'm not taking a picture. Thank you. So where did the title come from? You didn't ask me. I said you had me at hello. So I spent the first 30 years of my life really with imposter syndrome, thinking I was not lovable. And this is because at age seven, a bully told me that I was picked up from the street, that I didn't belong to my family. At age 10, I had my first crush, but as Ed Sheeran would say, she didn't love the shape of me. I mean, she didn't love the shape of my nose. <laughs> so that didn't work out. So for the next 20 years, I assumed that I am not lovable. And that is when this beautiful girl told me, and I was married by that time actually, but I still did not believe the love. So my wife held my face close to hers and said, you had me at hello. Do you hear me? And that was the first time when I paused and said, oh, actually, she really means it. And the last 25 years have been, you know, we just celebrated our 31 years together. So that's the first part of... So I want to leave you with... And I'm, I'm beginning to gloat here. So that was the first good word that I heard. The second set of good words I heard was, was from my teenage daughter when she was 12 or 13. She was 13. And what she said was, Daddy, in the whole wide, wide world, you get me. To me, that was the most heartwarming thing to hear from a teenage daughter. And the third heartwarming word that I've heard ever in my life was from a patient. I used to practice in West Coast, Washington State for six years before I came to Mayo Clinic in academic medicine, and this patient said, why are you leaving this practice? I wanted to die by your side. So friends, my invitation to you is this. In your relationship, make sure you tell somebody you had me at hello. Make sure you do that. When you have kids in your life, your kids or someone else, else's kids, make sure they believe that you trust them. They believe that you understand them. And when you're serving people, make sure people want to die by your side. That, to me, is a life well lived, a life full of purpose, and a happy life. Thank you. Thanks for having me. If you enjoyed this amazing well-being content, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel.